Hello, it's Helen Sharman here, British astronaut from Sheffield. I haven't worn my astronaut jacket today, um, so I know I don't look very astronauty, uh, but it's really hot here today. It's about 30 degrees, and I thought if I put on my astronaut jacket, I would look even more hot and sweaty than I do already, so I hope you don't mind. But I have seen your questions. Thank you so much for sending those in, and so now I'll do my best to answer them. Lots of experiments take place in space. What sorts of things do we learn by experimenting? Experimenting. Well, of course, in general terms, we experiment to test a hypothesis, which is really an idea that might explain a situation or a set of facts. But in space, we can do experiments without the effect of gravity. Now, this is great because it can often simplify a situation, make it more easy to understand. But generally, it's about understanding science better. Now, one of the things we can do in space is to investigate our own bodies. And astronauts have done loads of experiments. I did experiments on my own body. Um, these are helping us to improve life on Earth. We do experiments in conjunction with doctors. Uh, we're looking at our own bones, for instance. Astronauts' bones get weaker very quickly. And that is often very similar to the effects of ageing on Earth or how bones might get weaker, for instance, with certain illnesses. And we can look at that and then um, help doctors to treat um, situations like osteoporosis on Earth. Also, things like diabetes can be um, looked at in space. Uh, astronauts' eyes often get a lot of a bigger, higher pressure inside them. And we can look at that, the effects of that and how we can improve that and work with doctors on Earth to treat people with glaucoma, um, which is when there's a higher pressure in the eye that can make people go blind. Other things we can do in space, we're looking at new materials. Some materials, particularly mixtures of metals, might separate or certain parts of, the, of those mixtures might separate out on Earth, but in space they don't separate. So we can make different materials, bring them back to Earth and investigate those in the future, even use them in large scale engineering. I got very excited in space to be able to make crystals of protein in space. Now we can grow crystals of protein on Earth, but they're quite small and they're often very badly formed inside. But in space, you can grow them much bigger and better formed. And then when you bring them back to Earth, we can understand those proteins and how they interact in the body much better because of those crystals. And we're making medicines based on protein crystals that have been grown in space. And of course, the other thing is growing plants. There's a lot of work on plants in space that won't just help us to farm better on Earth and to just understand the science, the biology behind plants. But when we're thinking about where humans are going in the long term, possibly to Mars, we think we're going to need to grow our own food. So a Martian colony will be helped to grow its food because of experiments that are being done in space at the moment. Did you always want to pursue a career in science and potentially get to travel into space? If so, or if not, what inspired you to pursue your career and take the opportunity to become the first British space explorer? Going into space, being an astronaut, well, it was just not possible when I was at school. I didn't even think about it because there was no possibility. Nobody from this country could go into space. We didn't have a space agency. It wasn't even, even something to think about. I did struggle at school to decide what I wanted to do afterwards because I liked quite a lot of different things. I enjoyed learning about foreign languages, music, sciences. In the end, I thought if I were to study science or engineering, then that would give me more opportunities later on in life and I could perhaps have a different variety of choices, a bigger variety of choices than if I studied something else. I chose chemistry but it could have been almost any science. I quite liked chemistry, but I was just choosing something to keep open opportunities. Now I used my science in my first job. I got a job in the electronics industry making display screens. That was good fun. And then my second job was working for Mars Confectionery. I worked in teams of people making ice cream and chocolate. You know, what a great job to have. I didn't think about being an astronaut until I heard of the opportunity. Uh, all of a sudden, a space mission, a new space mission had been created and it was looking for people from Britain to apply to be an astronaut. And I made that application and that's how I got the job. 
Now, I do think it's interesting that, you know, how can we know and choose what to do if we don't know what there is out there? But the world is changing so fast. There's going to be so many new opportunities in the future that we can't even dream of right now. The important thing is just to do lots of different things in life, enjoy what we're doing and to keep open options as much as we can so that when something amazing does come up like that, we're in the best place to have a go. It's a very exciting time to be alive. I would love to be a successful businessman in the spotlight. What, would you, what advice would you give to someone in my position? Well, business. I think there's quite a few things I learned in space that can be translated into business. Things like the value of really good teamwork, of open communications, being honest with people, of not being scared of big challenges and hard work, learning from our mistakes. And really importantly, all of the preparation. So, I mean, you can start now, of course, by practicing being diligent, um, being persistent, um, working hard, learn by your mistakes and try again when things go wrong. But as for being in the spotlight, well, you know, if you are successful and you want to be recognised publicly, there are plenty of ways to do that. But it's the activity that has to come first. And before that, of course, all of the preparation. So just thinking about my space flight, um, I spent a few days in space, but before that, 18 months of training. That was building on five years, over five years in industry, of experience there, working in teams, doing all sorts of things that were in part relevant to my space flight. And that was after what, 13 or so years at school and all the other things, other activities I was doing in life um, that go towards building up skills and experience that we need to do certain types of things, certain jobs in life. So I think you've got a great future ahead of you if you can lay down some really good foundations now. And those foundations are what you're starting to do already, I'm sure, by working hard with schoolwork, um, by learning from your mistakes, um, by doing lots of different types of hobbies to get different types of skills, uh, and importantly, spending time with friends, learning uh, about really good communication. Good luck. How big of an adjustment is it going to space and is it difficult getting back to a normal routine? Adjusting to life in space, I think, is actually quite easy. And that's really because we've had a lot of training beforehand. We've learnt what we need to know, we've physically trained and also mission control, map out our days, they schedule us to the nearest five minutes. So actually being in space isn't that hard. The biggest difference, I suppose, is the physical changes. So inside our bodies, as the body fluids move towards our head, it takes two or three days before our, our brains work out what's going wrong and we excrete two litres of fluid more than we, we would normally as urine and then we feel a bit more normal again, but that then has a knock-on effect on other body processes. So that takes a while for our bodies to really completely adapt. Some people feel quite sick in space, space sickness. Coming back to Earth, I think, though, is much harder than actually adapting to life in space. Not just physically, uh, we have to get used to balance again, up and down. Our body fluids are moving away from our heads, so our hearts have to pump up. So having been used to feeling weightless in space, we're having to get used to feeling weight on Earth. But then after that, we suddenly move off into a whole load of debriefings. There's medical debriefings, technical debriefings. It doesn't just suddenly stop. So in many respects, that helps us. Um, physically, it's harder coming back to Earth. Mentally, well, we adjust because, partly because we have to, but it doesn't, it's not a sudden adjustment. I went from doing medical and technical debriefings to carrying out tra traditions like going on a parade through Star City, going to the Kremlin and be given a medal, which was fantastic. Then coming back to the United Kingdom and doing press conferences, giving talks. So actually, gradually, my life just changed into something different. So it was a gradual adapting. I made it different. I learned from other people, I listened to advice from all sorts, from other astronauts as well as from other people who were doing similar things to the things that I thought I wanted to do after my space flight. 
and that helped me an awful lot. But I just think it's really great that we are, as human beings, so adaptive, both physically and mentally. Of course, every one of us has different situations in life, different circumstances that we have to cope with, but also it means that that makes us unique and we're in the best place later on to make our own very positive difference to the world. What did you eat in space? I thought space food was quite nice actually. Of course it has to last a long time because we don't get supplies very frequently from Earth. So we don't have fresh food very much, but you know it's in packets, it's in tins sometimes, um, or tubes, anything that helps it not to go off. I had things like dried vegetable soup that I could add water to, add hot water to actually, so it was quite nice. I had dried apricot juice, I rather liked that. Tins of fish in tomato sauce, I like that very much actually, and meat and potatoes that we could heat up if necessary. I had tubes of um, cream cheese, it looked a bit like toothpaste actually, and we could squeeze out these bits of like long thin bits of cream cheese from the end of the tube, just like squeezing out a long bit of toothpaste, and there were bits of pineapple in that cream cheese, so that was really nice. Um, what else did I have? A lot of water, I really enjoyed hot chocolate, that was dried and I could add hot water to the packet and just it was like instant hot chocolate. But I think one of the most fun things to eat in space is bread. Now we didn't take up a big bread loaf because then we would have to cut it up, that might make crumbs, or if, you, if we break up a bread roll that might make crumbs as well. So instead the bread was baked already in very tiny little bread loaves, little mini portions of bread. So when I wanted to have some bread I would just take out a little bit of bread from the packet and I could either eat it for myself or if I wanted to pass it to somebody, so let's say you wanted to have some bread and you're sitting across, sitting, you would be sitting anywhere in space, would you? But let's say you were across, floating across the table from where I was in space. Then if you wanted to have some of the bread, if you didn't mind my fingers, I could just take out a bit of bread from the packet and then just push it towards you. And because you're in the direct line where the bread's coming, all you have to do is open your mouth and you can catch the bread and eat it. My training was all done in the Russian language, so first of all I had to learn how to speak Russian and fitness training went all the way through my preparation. But once I'd learnt enough Russian, then the theoretical training started. I had to learn about some really basics, things like the position of stars, so that um, we could steer, navigate the spacecraft really, um, using stars as a map. There was a theory of flight, uh, Learning, and learning about the orbits, all that sort of background work um, was really interesting actually. Gradually things got a little bit more practical, we learned about the technology of life support, the electronics and all the other hardware on board the, um, the space station and the Soyuz spacecraft that we were going to launch into space inside. The simulators were quite fun because in there we would go through different scenarios, everything we hoped would happen and also everything we hoped would not happen, so we knew what to do if something went wrong. There was emergency training, so what would happen, for instance, how would I deal with a situation of coming back to Earth and ending up in the sea instead of on dry land where we wanted to end up? So I spent three days down in the Black Sea learning about sea survival. But I think the best part of the training, everybody agrees, is the weightless training. And this is where we're in an aeroplane and the pilot makes the aeroplane fly along in a straight line and then goes up in a loop. And this loop is shaped like an upside down parabola. But when the aeroplane reaches the top of this loop, the pilot just lets it fall back towards the earth. And because we're falling inside the aeroplane that's just falling around us for a few seconds, we feel weightless. And that is amazing. Now, mental training, we didn't do specifically, but the psychologists were monitoring our behaviour throughout everything else. And actually, there were a lot of social events and other activities that very much helped us mentally to prepare. Who oh, do you miss the most? I was only in space for eight days, and that wasn't really long enough to miss people. I'd 
been living in Russia away from my family and friends for 18 months during my training. So really just a few days in space wasn't much extra. But for people who are in space a long time, they really do miss their family and their friends. It's the people who they love, people who they're used to living with and being close to, spending a lot of time with normally on Earth. I think also astronauts miss having that variety of people around us. And if you think most days on Earth, there's quite a lot of different people that we kind of interact with, even if we don't actually talk to them. We might just see people out of the window, we might see how they're behaving, and that gives us some sort of input. It helps us think a little bit. And it's that variety of different people that astronauts miss. But more than anything, it's the people who we love, our friends and our family. And it's those people that astronauts so look forward to seeing again when we get back to Earth. What happened to our photos we took in space? The photographs I took in space were all on a very old fashioned camera, one of those with film inside because it was before the days of digital cameras and mobile phones. So that meant I didn't take quite so many photographs as astronauts can take these days. But I did take some and I brought the films back and they were developed and some of those photographs I put into a book and others I use now, in fact, when I'm giving talks about my space flight. I also put my favourite photograph of the Earth on my website. But if you really want to see loads of gorgeous photographs, NASA's website has got an amazing array of all sorts of photographs of astronauts, of the Earth, of stars. Definitely worth a visit. What did going to space teach you about the importance of science? Now I knew before I went into space, of course, that science helps us to understand our surroundings. But I think being in space really taught me how much science helps to improve life on Earth whether it's through medicines or technology for business or entertainment and so much more. I think it's also being in space that showed me how much just part of our daily lives science is. Uh, it's so obvious in space, of course, when you see how it's impacting your body. I mean, for instance, how also interconnected the different sciences are, physics, chemistry, biology, you can't really separate them. As I didn't feel gravity anymore, body fluids started to move towards my head. That was a physical change. But when my brain worked out there was too much fluid in the cells in my head, told my kidneys to excrete more urine than normal, um, that was then had an effect on the amount of potassium in my muscles and calcium in my bones. So that affected my body's chemistry and that had a knock-on effect on the biology. So of course it was really obvious how interconnected science is but also interconnections on Earth. So when you look out at the Earth, I mean, it really does seem quite small sometimes from space. It is so obvious that what we do on one side of the Earth impacts what happens on the other. Uh, it's so important that science is used better, I think, to understand um, the impact of our actions and how that affects other parts of the Earth. But really importantly for me is that we as a society, we all include science in the things that we debate so that together, collectively, we can make the right decisions on the best use of science to benefit the world. Which was the most scary, taking off or landing? Ooh, take off or landing? Hmm. Well, of course, for a launch, astronauts are sitting on top of a rocket full of fuel that might explode. But actually, rockets with people in nowadays, at least, are quite reliable. And there's lots to do, usually, during a launch, so that distracts the people inside. Coming back to Earth, well, that's more hazardous. There are more things that might go wrong. But then coming back, it's quite a journey, really. It's quite exciting. As we get towards the atmosphere and the atmosphere starts to get thicker. I remember looking outside of the window and I could see the colours of the really hot gases and the thickness of the atmosphere then created a lot of G. It was harder physically 
coming back to Earth than it was during the launch. I remember when the parachutes opened, they swung the spacecraft really side to side very violently, and then there was a bump as we did hit the ground. Now, was the return scary? Well, not really, because I knew what was happening, and the launch wasn't scary either, because I knew what I had to do. I knew what was going on around me, and I think we're scared of what we don't know. So even though I didn't want to come back to Earth and I wasn't really scared, certainly the return was quite an experience. Just looking at the air from space inspired you to write or draw something creative. If so, can, can you share it with us. Being creative isn't something I spend an awful lot of time doing at the moment, I'm afraid. But now you mention it, I might think about making a piece of music, composing something that feels like space does. Now that'd be fun. But one of the things I did have the chance to do after my space flight was to spend a day with the watercolour painter from Yorkshire, Ashley Jackson. Now this was a great day for me. I'd never been taught how to paint at school and Ashley taught me how to paint that really famous painting. I'm sure you'll know it. It's Monet's Bridge over a pond of water lilies. It's one of my favourite paintings actually. And being with Ashley that day was super because for a change I got to see the world instead of through my own eyes, through the eyes of an artist through Ashley Jackson's eyes. Now that painting, I think, got auctioned off for charity. It wouldn't have been a patch on Ashley's, so I'm not sure how much money it made, but it was a great day. I can't show you the painting, but um, one of these days, perhaps I'll compose that piece of music and, uh, and we can get together to compare our creativity. Well, thank you for listening. I hope that answers your questions. Stay curious.